Hello and welcome back. Um, hope you were able to enjoy this short break and let's continue for the last stretch. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Chris Weber, NetApp E-Series Technical Lead. And his, the title of his talk is Accelerating AI Workloads with BGFS Parallel File System and Net Storage. Mr. Weber, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Chris Weber, and I'm a technical lead in the E-Series AI Solutions Group here at NetApp. Today, I'm presenting uh, Accelerating AI Workloads with BGFS Parallel File System and NetApp Storage. So first off, I'd like to touch on some of the challenges in AI and HPC workloads today. Uh, then I will present some solution reference architectures. We'll dig a little bit into the BGFS parallel file system. And then finally, we'll touch on GPU direct storage. So first off, uh, when we start talking about an organization that wants to get into HPC or AI, there are a few common challenges we know these groups are gonna face as they try to put something together. Essentially, you're building a supercomputer, and believe it or not, bringing up a supercomputer is hard. There are a lot of moving parts with complex interoperability challenges and a software stack that's constantly changing. Uh, the next thing we generally see is difficulty maintaining the required performance at scale. Uh, if something changes in your compute or storage areas, or if your workload changes, it can be difficult to keep up without an expert to provide guidance. Uh, really, any time spent researching hardware components or software stacks, interoperability, data pipelines, that's all time you aren't spending delivering AI insights, which is your main goal. And then uh, finally, when customers build out their own solutions, management and monitoring, they can come as an afterthought if even done at all. And you know, at the end of the day, you want your team doing data science, not designing and monitoring infrastructure. So what if you could easily deploy a standardized, validated AI or HPC solution with end-to-end -end support and scale that solution over time as your needs changed? How valuable would it be to get started on your AI work immediately instead of becoming supercomputer experts first? Uh, how confident would you feel knowing that your system was using all the best practices and most optimized stack available? This is where NetApp AI solutions come in. We offer multiple flexible AI building blocks designed for a variety of AI workloads. Each is simple to deploy, manage, and monitor. And finally, they're backed by NetApp's world-class support. In the off chance that something does go wrong, or you just need an expert to help troubleshoot something along the way, we're here to help. So NetApp offers two primary choices for your AI solution needs. There's an ONTAP based AI pod solution and BGFS based pods for those even more demanding workloads. So when would you choose one versus the other? It depends on the environment and workloads. If you already have, or you're planning an ethernet based environment, then the ONTAP AI pods are likely the best choice. Likewise, if there's already an InfiniBand network or you're planning on using InfiniBand, the BGFS pods make the most sense. But what if your environment is flexible or you're designing it all from scratch? That's where the workloads come in. If you have multiple people running a lot of small AI jobs, then ONTAP AI makes sense. But if you're running fewer massive jobs or operating on huge files, then the BGFS pods might be better. So let's look at the ONTAP AI solution. Uh, at an extremely high level, it's pretty simple. It's some AFF 800s plugged in with some NVIDIA DGX compute nodes. In practice, it's a bit more complicated. This is where having a well-designed, highly optimized and validated reference architecture provides a lot of benefit over a DIY solution. Uh, you know, you can see how complex this looks just at a uh, 
at a high level and you know when NetApp tests and validates this you can be guaranteed that the overall architecture is going to give you a solution that really works in your environment um, you can build this hybrid cluster with HDDs and some SSDs. Uh, there's a lot of knobs you can really turn with this overall architecture to design a solution that's just right for you. Uh, you could do some cost-effective tiering right next to the compute. Uh, you can use some volume moves or flex cache to accelerate onto the SSDs. Uh, on tap features like snaps and clones can be used in your workflow integration. And you can see here that a couple of architectures have actually been tested and validated. Uh, there's a hybrid Ethernet and InfiniBand architecture where the DGXs use their traditional InfiniBand compute fabric. Uh, but there's also a complete Ethernet-based solution if you're looking for that more data, data center standardized design. So some of the top reasons that you would want to deploy NetApp ONTAP AI, uh, it really simplifies the deployment there. Uh, you could save a lot of money over trying to do this all in the cloud. And, you know, just overall a number of benefits. So what about those BGFS pods? Uh, for some workloads, like cutting-edge AI research, large-scale AI training, uh, natural language processing, even HPC simulations, you're going to want the benefits of a parallel file system. And we'll get into some of those a little bit later. So, again, at a high level, this is fairly simple. You've got your DGX compute nodes with the GPUs plugged into an InfiniBand network uh, with a BGFS cluster backed by some NetApp EF series storage behind there. So, you know, let's dig in a little bit more. You've got the DGX A100s, uh, you've got some InfiniBand switches, and then you can see uh, each BGFS building block here is a couple of x86-based servers and two EF600 storage arrays. So I mentioned the term building block. Let's look. So you've got a pair of servers and a pair of EF600s in one building block, and then another pair of BGFS servers and another pair of EF600s for the next building block. And each of these are connected into the InfiniBand compute fabric along with the DGX compute nodes. And if you need more storage performance or more storage capacity, it's as easy as just adding more of these blocks into the fabric. So let's take a little closer look at an individual block here. Uh, you could see that each block is designed with performance and resiliency in mind. Uh, there's multiple InfiniBand connections to multiple InfiniBand switches, and each of the x86 storage servers is coupled to each of the EF600s. So, you know, no individual InfiniBand port or path or anything going down along the way, or even an entire x86 storage server going down. Everything here will stay up and running. And if we take an even closer look, uh, a peek behind the curtains, we can see that uh, individual storage and metadata services are tuned to run on particular NUMA zones on the servers. You know, we've really done the heavy lifting here for you. Uh, you know, everything here is highly tuned for maximum performance. And it all looks a little daunting and complicated, but, you know, we've automated the deployment of all of this via Ansible, so you don't even need to worry about the details. Uh, the only thing you really need to figure out is the IP addresses for the BGFS servers and the EF storage arrays backing them. Uh, 
here is just a peek at what some of the hardware looks like. Uh, no cables, because once you start adding in all the cables, it, it's a lot less pretty to look at there. So, you know, here are some numbers uh, for just a reference building block, one that's a converged metadata and storage building block built with the default configuration. A single block would give about 66 gigabytes uh, per second of read bandwidth or 22 gigabytes per second of write bandwidth. Uh, if you add a second block, those numbers scale up linearly. Yeah, you know, three blocks keep scaling. Uh, the IOPS, each block adds about 1.3 million reads, 900,000 writes. Again, those scale linearly. The same for uh, if you break those down to ML perf training uh, calculations. Again, those scale. And this particular block, uh, each one had a usable capacity of 431 terabytes. And again, that just scales by adding more blocks. So building a BGFS file system. Uh, let's get into kind of the how and why we've done this. So a lot of the HPC and AI workloads that are out there, they require the performance of a parallel file system. And BGFS is NetApp's preferred parallel file system. It's not one that we have developed in-house. There are multiple parallel file systems out there. We've tested them all. And we really believe that BGFS is a great file system for these particular workloads and use cases. Um, you know, I mentioned before some performance numbers for building blocks. Uh, there's a concept of uh, both uh, metadata and storage running on a, on a single building block. Or if you just want to add a little more storage capacity, uh, we offer storage only building blocks as well. Uh, you could fit up to five of these in a 42U rack. It just depends on how much power and cooling you have available in those racks. Um, and you know, per building block, you could get up to, for storage only building blocks, a maximum bandwidth of 76 gigabytes per second. And here you can see just adding uh, three of these blocks, you could get 220 gigabytes per second read, about four and a half million IOPS, uh, you know, lots of files out there. And uh, with these three particular building blocks in this example, you'd have almost two petabytes usable. And this is all just in a single rack here. Uh, if you want to scale that up, you can add three more of these building blocks and add another 220 gigabytes per seconds of reads, another four and a half million IOPS performance there. Or say you have billions upon billions of files. You just scale those up by adding more blocks as well. So why BGFS? Uh, the other parallel file systems that are out there, major ones, uh, you can get tied into a specific hardware vendor. BGFS is its own open source project. Um, it's externally owned and managed outside of NetApp. So, you know, you're not even tied just to NetApp storage. It is a complete independent parallel file system provider. It has a simple licensing model. A, you're not tied to capacity or however many clients you have out there. It's just uh, the number of storage nodes that you have in your overall solution. Uh, BGFS, it scales linearly and non-disruptively. If you want to add in the future, you just add to it. It's really performant with small and large IO. Uh, it distributes the metadata operations very well. Uh, 
the client support, uh, many, many Linux distributions are supported as BGFS clients, and it's all in user space. You don't have to go patching the kernel or recompiling kernels or any of that. Um, it's easy to use and manage. There's not a whole lot of tuning required. And again, we have done most of the tuning for you. And outside of our reference architecture, you can even run BGFS on a number of platform architectures. You can just go grab it for free. So, you know, BGFS is what we believe the best option for our reference architecture here. And we believe in this quite a bit that we have spent years uh, uh, adding on to BGFS and developing automation on top of it. Uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, it's complex with all these services and storage targets out there, highly tuned, uh, but we have Ansible automations out there. So again, you just specify the IPs, add it into the uh, <clears throat> playbook and you're good to go. Uh, we have built the BGFS CSI driver. Uh, this allows integration in a Kubernetes environment. And at that point, anything you can do in Kubernetes, you know, a BGFS directory just looks like a volume out in Kubernetes. Uh, it makes working this into your workflows much easier. Uh, and NetApp has also developed BGFS plugins for analyzing performance using a Grafana dashboard. So lots of benefits pairing NetApp with BGFS rather than just using either one on its own. So, you know, the hardware just out of the gate, uh, all optimized and tuned is pretty fast, but you know, let's make it go faster. You know, what else can we do? So if you're out there and familiar with what's on the horizon, uh, you're aware that GPU direct storage is coming. Uh, if you're not familiar with GPU direct storage, it's basically a way of eliminating the uh, buffers uh, called bounce buffers that have to pass through the CPU and traditional system memory. And you can cut all of that out and essentially the GPU can access the storage directly, hence the name GPU direct storage. Um, you know, and if you cut the CPU and the system memory out of the loop of accessing storage, that frees up CPU cycles for additional processing. And, um, you're no longer wasting some of your RAM on just moving data around. And really, once you add GPU direct storage, it's not just a single benefit, it actually provides benefits in both the, uh, the reading and preparing the data, as well as the writing the data back out at the end of a workload. So it's, you know, really, adding more benefits than just one. So ONTAP AI, uh, if you're familiar with ONTAP, you know that it's an NFS based solution and traditional NFS, you know, it's all TCP based. And so your storage is connected. You've got the NIC in there that goes to the PCI switch up through the CPU, up to memory, all the way back to the CPU, back to the PCI switch, finally to the GPU. Traditional NFS over TCP, while it can still be very performant, uh, you know, GPU direct and NFS over RDMA can start cutting some of the inefficiencies out of the loop. So NFS over RDMA allows the GPU to just go direct to system memory and then paired with GPU direct storage actually allows you to cut the access to system memory out altogether. 
Uh, so NFS over RDMA, this was actually released in ONTAP 9.10.1. It's out there already, uh, only in NFS version 4.0. Uh, the other versions are set to follow in upcoming releases. Uh, the cool thing is GPU direct storage doesn't require anything beyond NFS over RDMA support. It's all there. You can use this today. It's the same NFS protocol you've been using for years. No changes to the applications or processes. You just say, uh, add the RDMA protocol at mount time. Um, everything else is pretty much the same there. It's just almost getting stuff for free. Uh, RDMA is typically done over Rocky. Uh, just folks to be aware there. Uh, some performance numbers here. Uh, this was based on just a single A800. Uh, you can see the blue bars are CPU based accesses and the green ones are adding GPU direct into the mix. And at the small I.O. sizes at 4K, uh, you're really seeing the benefits shine there. And with BGFS, so what about it? That is not an NFS-based solution. That is, you know, BGFS parallel file system. Well, great news here. Uh, NetApp, we have worked with uh, BGFS to ensure that GPU direct storage is going to be ready for it as well. Uh, you can see before, uh, you know, the GPU would have to go out to the system memory and the CPU, and there's that nasty bounce buffer out there. And on the right side, with GPU direct storage, it's all cut out. The GPU can go direct to the BGFS servers and all the way out to the EF600 storage behind them. <clears throat> uh, this add, it increases the overall bandwidth, it decreases the latency for accessing the data, resulting in a greater number of ML ops per second. Uh, here are some numbers here, uh, just showing that the orange is the traditional CPU-based methods. And the blue is CPU direct, just really increasing that bandwidth overall. Uh, over here, uh, this was gathering some measurements uh, with the CPU-based system. This particular workload was using about 25 to 30 percent of the CPU. Uh, moving it over to GPU direct, the CPU workload is down in the low single digits, freeing up those CPU cycles for actual AI workload and not just moving data back and forth. Uh, just some more numbers here. Um, as we're modifying the IO sizes, uh, you could see the Q file, which is the GPU direct based accesses performance um, is higher bandwidth for all sizes and latency. Uh, POSIX is slower. And if you know latency, um, you know, the faster the better with the Q file, much lower latency all around as well. So just really trying to drive home the point here that GPU direct storage um, is going to get you even better performance than just traditional GPU, CPU based workloads. Uh, so maybe just a little teaser of something else that's on the horizon. Uh, you know, we really had, oh, there's these ONTAP AI solutions and there's the BGFS based solutions. And, you know, what if both really make sense? You want to do some of the uh, smaller AI jobs, but you also want the capability to do the massive uh, AI jobs out there as well. That's where Supercluster comes in. So we are in the process of building up an architecture, you know, all centered around the NVIDIA DGX compute nodes, 
but adding in NetApp ONTAP AI, as well as a BGFS cluster all into your overall storage network. And, you know, stay tuned in the future. Uh, we'll have more details on that and we can do a deep dive on that as well. So key takeaways here, NetApp offers both ONTAP based and BGFS based AI solutions for your different AI workloads. Uh, these solutions reduce the time needed to deploy and execute the AI workloads. And client enhancements such as NFS over RDMA and GPU direct storage can accelerate, accelerate these AI workloads even further. So thank you very much for attending my presentation today. Um, if you would fill out the feedback form, we would very much appreciate it. I'd like to know uh, if this was useful. And one lucky person that does fill out the form will win a Google Home Mini. So thank you again and goodbye. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Weber, uh, for your insight on how AI can accelerate, uh, how you can accelerate AI workloads in BGFS parallel file system. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Richard Graham and the title is Scale Spe uh, is in Network Computing. Mr. Graham hails from Scale Special Interest Group Chair at HPC AI Advisory Council. Mr. Graham, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Richard Graham. I'm from the HPC AI Advisory Council. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is, is the concept of in-network in computing uh, in, in high-performance computing uh, and how it relates to high-performance computing. Um, give some examples uh, and, and, and proceed uh, from there. So before, before we start talking about the technical details, just a, a bit of background about the, about the Advisory Council. Uh, it's, the Advisory Council is a world, worldwide uh, com uh, community. It was established in 2008. It has, uh, head, it has presence in, in uh, four different locations across the world. Headquarters are in the Bay Area in California. Um, it also has uh, um, an office in, in Austin, Texas, a presence in, in Switzerland, as well as a, a presence in China. Uh, currently, there are more than 400 uh, member companies, uh, universities and research centers that participate uh, in, the, in the council's activities. Um, and the goal, the goal of, this, of the community is really to, uh, to help uh, bridge the gap between what current practice for, for many people in terms of high performance computing and AI uh, and, and move it ahead to where uh, it could be and help direct uh, uh, things into the future, direct technology into the future. It focuses on several, uh, it does this in several different ways. Uh, it provides uh, best practice examples, uh, letting people understand um, what can be done today, uh, how to look at applications, how to analyze them, uh, where, where uh, gaps may exist in the application and the like that may need to be focused on. Provides education opportunities, um, gives uh, technology demonstrations, uh, and, and also has a, a center where one can uh, um, actually try out some of these things uh, on, on, real, on real hardware, real current hardware. Uh, and also a very important role that the council plays is in exploring futures of technology. What, what can be done beyond uh, what's done today can help. So let's talk a bit uh, first about, about the, uh, uh, the uh, hands-on center, the, uh, the cluster center uh, that exists. It's a, cent a center that's available uh, free of cost for, uh, for people to use. Uh, it has about 14, uh, 14 clusters uh, that, that can be used. Uh, it's provided, provided free of charge. Uh, there's both, uh, and it has a variety of compute uh, network and storage technologies. 
And here's the URL here to get a bit more information on exactly what uh, what hardware is available uh, at the center. So in general, uh, just to highlight a few a few of the systems, uh, there's a an, an eight node uh, AMD uh, cluster, uh, Rome based cluster uh, that has uh, ConnectX six HDR or 200 gigabit per second network attached to it. Um, and uh, around 256 gig gigabytes of total memory uh, and storage associated with it is Lustre and NFS. There are two 32 uh, node clusters um, with with Intel ba Intel based processors. Both of them are are Skylake based processors. There's a, a one that's a Dell six, uh, C6400 uh, cluster with uh, uh, eight HDR100. Uh, gigabit uh, per second uh, 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 network uh, network adapters, uh, 192 gigabytes of memory and storage. There is also Lustre and NFS. And the second one is based on a super micro uh, super super micro architecture um, uh, that that also has ConnectX6 HDR as well as HDR100 uh, um, adapters on it and uh, a corresponding quantum switch, also with 192 gigabytes of, of memory uh, on it. There's also a, an eight node uh, IBM uh, Power 8 system uh, that's also available with that particular system has ConnectX4 or 100 gigabit per second uh, InfiniBand adapters. The uh, switching a bit to, to the sort of uh, things that are available in terms of best practices. So what what's done uh, uh, is uh, at particular uh, applications are, are selected. And I have a list here on, on the screen here on the order of 70 different applications that have been uh, used for this analysis. One takes uh, with a given uh, input deck, someone ran benchmarks, collected uh, performance data, network information, a whole bunch of analysis on it. And each of these applications uh, uh, has a, uh, a presentation that shows all, all the data. It gives information on how the job was run and the like. And so one can go there and look and see the sort of characteristics that exist uh, you know, for a particular application uh, and, and see some of the tools that have been used to, to analyze the data and, and, and give a basis to you know, maybe start uh, doing some, uh, some investigation on, one, on one's own. Um, so again, these are these uh, um, best practice uh, uh, studies are available online. Uh, this is a picture actually of the, of the page where one can access each of each of the uh, each of the studies uh, from it. Let's switch direct, uh, direction a bit and talk about uh, move to the to the topic of of today's uh, presentation, uh, the technical talk to uh, topic. And it is uh, the use of in in network computing. So before uh, before we start talking a bit about some about some of the technologies that exist today and how they're used, I really want to uh, highlight why there is interest in 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 network computing. Why is this an important uh, topic to look at? Uh, and so first of all, uh, the objectives for uh, for in network computing, uh, I've listed two here. One. Uh, the goal here is really to allow the host uh, to focus its resources on computation. You know, typically buys uh, very capable uh, uh, processing elements, CPUs, GPUs, or other type of processing elements. And and the best use of their best use, the best use of those resources are really for what they were designed for was for for compute. And so the goal here uh, is to uh, really uh, move uh, move uh, computing uh, that's not associated with with that, with uh, the algorithms that one is trying to uh, to use. Um, so compute computing more that's associated with the network, move it away from the network to uh, to I mean move it away from the from the host to the network and and let the network portion do 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 the network work. Uh, and and then. When that's when that's done, the network resources are, are used for uh, for managing network traffic, 
you know, when we talk about network traffic here, we're talking about things like MPI, Open SHMEM, communication, UPC, storage, uh, sort of uh, network traffic generated by applications for, for application needs. Um, and also, uh, while the data is on the network, where it makes sense, process that data if this can be done in a more efficient way. So, so if you think of your collectives, for example, some of the collective work can be done on the network and improve overall uh, 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 application performance. Um, so let's take a historical view of, of systems. Looking back uh, a couple decades ago, uh, the way systems uh, used to be de used to be designed, uh, the CPU was really the center, uh, the center of of the universe, the center of the of the system, at the center of the cluster. All the work that most of the work that was done was done on the CPU, uh, computation, communication, uh, I/O. Every, most of the work associated with that. Uh, happened it was done by the CPU, and so the CPU was was used uh, both for application computation as well as for communication. Latencies were also high, be, uh, for, and part of it was because uh, because of the dependency on the on the uh, uh, CPU doing the work, um, and also uh, uh, HPC framework latencies were fairly high because they depended again on on load sharing between. Uh, the, the the computation and the communication. So latencies were tens of microseconds. Uh, um, anyhow, um, and just not not good by today's standards. So the the first uh, the first uh, major change, or one of the first major changes that happened to to help uh, remedy the situation, is is uh, the the uh, invention of RDMA, accelerated HPC. So when when um, um, the network itself started to do the work that, that had been in the past, typically done by the CPU. So with RDMA, you can, you can send the data directly from the host to uh, some remote location uh, without CPU intervention or, or just with just enough CPU intervention to initiate uh, activity on, uh, initiate the activity uh, on the network and complete, you know, whatever communication framework semantics existed on the host uh, exist. Um, and so, what that meant is, all of a sudden, a lot of a lot of work that used to be done uh, on the CPU was moved to uh, is moved to the network. So all the progression, you know, getting data ready, packing it however it needs to be packed uh, for transmission, recent, uh, dealing with transmission completion and the like, that moves moved away from the host to the CPU, freeing up resources for the CPU. And so, of course, when one did, did measurements on CPU utilization, uh, the CPU utilization went down considerably uh, on, the, on the network. On the uh, CPU utilization went down considerably. And so the application got more of the time uh, necessary. Latencies such as ping latency all of a sudden become, start to become a lot, a lot lower. Uh, but again, the issue of of, of uh, dealing with the broader HP, uh, HPC framework and its use of the host is still uh, not an issue that's addressed at that stage. So just to give uh, you know a very simple, quick and simple example here of how this uh, of a tech, of a RDMA uh, enhancement that helped uh, overall end to end performance. We have a slide here from courtesy of, of uh, uh, DK Panda's group from Ohio State University. A GPU direct RDMA, where uh, the where data is transferred directly from GPU memory to GPU memory without any CPU intervention, and and is uh, offloaded to uh, to the network. So we see latencies coming coming down uh, uh, considerably close to close to an order of magnitude from around. Uh, these are uh, ping pong latencies coming coming down from on the order of uh, 20 microseconds down to. Um, uh, two to three mi microseconds uh, for for a ver for a zero byte latency, one byte late uh, one byte uh, latency. Bandwidths uh, are increasing, uh, both unidirectional and, and bidirectional. Uh, so that's a benefit of of, of the uh, of RDMA that in network computing technology. Then. 
then uh, then uh, the next thing uh, that's that's of relevant here relevance here the next goal here is is once primitive communications are, have been have been removed have been offloaded to the host is to look at, at, at what can one can do to accelerate frameworks where latencies associated latencies associated with those uh, frameworks tend to be um, considerably larger than those of just regular uh, ping pong latency and can have a, a fairly large uh, effect on or do have a fairly large effect on app overall application performance so think of collective operations here too so this this step in the in the in the evolution of the technology involves moving more complex uh, uh, workloads into into the network uh, and so I have a, 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 an example a figure here that shows um, uh, overall runtime for four applications for VASP, GPFS, Gromax, and uh, and GSI. And what we see here is is all these applications have uh, fairly fairly large portion of their time spent in communication, anywhere from 20 to 68 uh, percent for the particular uh, tests uh, that were chosen. Many of them have collective communication is the dominant uh, is the dominant uh, are the dominant. Uh, routines taking time uh, in these applications, and so starting to address collective communication with uh, with offload technologies or, or within network computing is certainly uh, certainly an important thing to do. And so, one of the new technologies that was invented uh, on the order uh, of probably seven years ago by now or so. Uh, is is the scalable hierarchical ag uh, aggregation reduction protocol, where this is a protocol that takes uh, that moves uh, a reduction type of operations uh, to the network. Uh, and so when when uh, to, to uh, uh, so this protocol, what this protocol does is it builds uh, a reduction tree in the network, uh, where each each node in the tree is a switch. Uh, the switch has the capability to do data reduction, um, and um, and and so what happens in this in, in this case is uh, the the nodes of the tree, uh, the leaves of the tree are hosts. So hosts will feed each host will, that's participating in in the reduction tree will feed its reduction data into the uh, into the network as data. So the blue lines uh, in this figure here show data going into the tree uh, and up the tree. So it goes uh, as the data goes uh, in the tree, it reaches a reduction node. Data is, data is re reduced there at the, at the switch, passed on to the, ne to the next uh, level in the, in, in the tree. And, and, with, with, and, and once the data reaches the root of the tree and reductions are done, finished there, uh, the result is distributed back down the tree. Uh, in, in reverse order to, to the way it came into the tree. Um, and so this is this is a, a very efficient way of uh, of doing, of, first of all, doing the operations. Two, it also completely frees the host from doing it, the, the reduction operations. Host isn't involved in, in, in the reduction operations here at all, and this can, happens in the background as the host, host can continue doing its computation. Um, so this 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 type of uh, uh, technology is good for operations such as is all reduce uh, barrier reduction broadcasts um, uh, and and so data basically here originates from either from one one process when it when it when it's in a broadcast or from a group of processes to the root and then the uh, the root dis uh, distributes the data back down to Another group of processes that can be the same or different from the original root, or in the case of of a, of a reduce, just one one uh, uh, rank, one one host. I'm sorry, one leaf will get the will get the data. Uh, the operations um, are uh, support are sufficient. The reduction operations are su sufficient to uh, to satisfy all MPI all the uh, reduction uh, permit. Uh, Operations defined in MPI, except for the product operation, um, and and all the operate, and as well as for for Open Schmim and other other such uh, 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 APIs such as UPC. Uh, one uh, and it supports uh, you know current implementations of this technology support 
uh, operands of size 1632 and 64 bits, signed and unsigned ints, as well as floating point uh, data. Um, one one thing to note uh, about reduction impact on application is, is as in any as any any reduction uh, operation, um, the the improvement to application depends a lot on uh, has uh, depends a lot also on 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 whether or not the, how well load balanced the uh, the application is that's that is how long how long how by how much the, the application uh, is delayed in terms of delivering data uh, for in the reduction operation. So a picture of how of how this uh, op, of this uh, works. We have uh, data going into the network. On 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 the uh, on the right here, we show what happens in in, in network computing. Data goes into the network, is reduced at each stage. Moves up the moves up the data, so the amount of data going going along the link uh, uh, in the network is fixed. That is, there's a reduction in total volume of data as as one goes up the tree, and uh, and there's not there's not really not contention uh, between uh, between nodes uh, on the network versus a traditional mode um, where uh, data. Constantly goes between endpoints, and so is there a fair amount of potential for 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 collisions in the way a lot more data goes through the network and the like, and and generally, uh, at least for large data, there's a theoretical advantage of of two x uh, for for end network computing over over the traditional uh, end end point based uh, reduction operations. Um, so we see, have some data here in terms of impact on uh, primitive benchmarks. Uh, they all reduce latency. Uh, uh, shown here on on the on the left, where uh, solid lines show latency uh, of of the sharp based uh, based reductions uh, for two to two up between for two and up to 128 nodes for a, a couple uh, message sizes. Dotted lines show the latency for host based optimized actually host based uh, implementations. We can see that clearly one uh, the reduction. Uh, using sharp is is much more efficient than using end, end point based uh, based approaches. Uh, the curve is is rather uh, has very small is rather flat for for sharp, and that's because of the large radices that are that are used within the switch. Um, and so the performance is good. The the right hand side shows uh, uh, the same type of information for sim, uh, similar size data, just at a, at a much larger size, fifteen hundred. Uh, nodes, and we see that the performance differences get there in practice up to 5x uh, performance improvements using Sharp. Impact on on uh, applications here, we have particular AI applications. We see first of all on the left, we see that the the reduction using uh, using Sharp uh, increases by a factor of two, again over uh, roughly a factor of two, uh, over over. Uh, Endpoint based based approaches in this particular case data happens to be coming from uh, from the source of the data is GPUs and we see the imp impact on on overall uh, AI workflows. So this is a TensorFlow using well, uh, the Horovod version. We see overall improvement uh, in in runtime of the uh, of the of the uh, AI application of about 15 percent. Um, Another example I'll talk about briefly here is hardware tag matching. Hardware tag matching is also offloaded to the network. Uh, the network, the network uh, can do the tag matching portion of, of uh, can offload the tag po portion uh, of, of, of MPI as well as the rendezvous protocol and give an opportunity to, uh, to again accelerate uh, application uh, performance. All this can happen in the background while the uh, application is computing. The new new item that's that's uh, com uh, coming uh, has started to come these days in terms of in-network computing is is uh, uh, using in-network computing in multi-tenant uh, type of uh, type of environments, where uh, what what happens in in this case the uh, uh, management of communication frameworks such as MPI and, and OpenShmem is is migrated to uh, away from the CPU to uh, to a, a DPU a data processing unit. Um, and also uh, some of the fr uh, frameworks associated with with, this, with these uh, computations are are offloaded, relieving the comp the uh, the host from doing the computational uh, computational work. 
Um, and so it, it frees up the resources uh, for computation uh, and also uh, the, on the host for computation. And it also uh, provides uh, provides uh, the ability for for increased security. Uh, these are some of the uh, the uh, the uh, aspects of of the uh, in of the multi tenant uh, uh, multi tenant tenant um, uh, in network computing uh, capabilities. Um, finally, uh, just a slide about some some activities that the HPC advise upcoming activities that the HPC AI Advisory Council is sponsoring in 2022. Uh, the, the 12th uh, annual conference uh, in Switzerland uh, will take place March 1st to the 4th, uh, uh, or actually is taking place March 1st to the 4th uh, in Switzerland. Um, uh, and the 13th annual Stanford uh, uh, conference is, is taking place uh, in April, April 11th to the 14th, um, also in, uh, in, uh, in Stanford, at Stanford. Uh, the 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 uh, council is also uh, sponsoring uh, several competitions, university competitions. The fifth annual HPC AI competition is taking place in March. Uh, the eleventh annual ISC uh, student competition, student cluster competition, is taking place in June. Uh, and the 10th annual APEC RDMA programming workshop and competition is taking place in July 2022. There are a few uh, links here for more information uh, online, uh, online uh, about the HPC Advisory Council as well as, uh, as an email uh, uh, link that can be used to, uh, to contact uh, the, the Advisory Council for more, more information. So th um, thank you very much for your time. All right. Thank you for this uh, for this talk, Mr. Dr. Graham. Uh, our next talk has two speakers. The title is AI at Supercomputing Scale. We have Mr. Philip Tan, General Manager for Southeast Asia, Graphcore, and uh, Mr. Xavier Vir uh, Virugu. Sorry again, because <laughs> I had to see it spelled. <laughs> Uh, head of High Performance AI Business Unit at ATOS. Thank you. So, um, very good afternoon to everyone dialing in online and uh, for those of you who are standing in, uh, sitting in front of me, very warm welcome. Uh, my name is Philip and together with me is uh, Dr. Xavier from <coughs> ATOS. And today we're going to share a little bit about GraphCore and what we do to bring AI at a super, super computing scale for our customers. So, but before I start, I'd like just to point out to a research paper here that introduces the term hardware lottery to describe when a research idea wins, not because it is the best idea, but because it is suited to the available hardware and software in the market. Meaning to say sometimes there could be research ideas which are much better, but their available hardware and software in the market might not be there to support it. So our starting premise is that there is a need to create a new approach to AI hardware design to meet future demands. And at GraphCore, we have developed the IPU to support uh, innovators to create the next breakthrough in machine intelligence. A little bit about GraphCore, we build products, AI, uh, hardware and software specifically for AI and machine learning. We, de we design our silicon specifically for AI and we call these devices IPUs, Intelligent Processing Units, which are radically different from historical architectures like CPU or GPU. The design of the IPU is analogous to the makeup of our brain, such that we have put compute, memory, and intercommunication side by side, just like how our brains have neurons and synapses tied together. And to maximize the potential of these IPUs, we also built our own software to program these IPUs, and we call the software Poplar SDK. And together we supply the IPUs and the Poplar software in a 1U platform, the M2000 machine, very simple plug and play device for customers to 
deploy, install, and be true. So machine learning has been evolving very rapidly in the last couple of years. Just a few years ago, the focus was all around convolutional neural network, where we were training models in a supervised learning approach defined by the use of labeled data sets to sort of supervise algorithms to classify objects or to predict outcomes accurately, how to tell if a picture contains a cat, for example. And then more recently, models have evolved to support transformer-based approaches where we are training models in a unsupervised learning approach <clears throat> where machine learning algorithms analyze cluster unlabeled data sets. And these algorithms can sometimes discover hidden patterns in data without human intervention. Learning structures of language like NLP or structures of pictures like uh, for vision transformer board models, for example. And you will realize that this will open the door for much more powerful models because we have so much unlabeled data and the size of models are getting bigger as well. So the amount of compute needs to grow exponentially to support these type of models and we all know that this is not sustainable. What we instead need to do is to move towards more complex models where the data is steered towards the relevant parameters for those bits and pieces of data in the model. And to do that, you need a much, much more complex uh, processor that has many more individual processing elements that can work well in parallel, much, much more individual processing core that can deal with the data complexities in these next generation models. And our IPU has been developed to support such an evolution that AI is going to evolve. The GC200 IPU processor from GraphCore it is the world's most complex processor when it was uh, introduced just about 18 months ago. Every GC200 processor has 1,472 independent processor core. And each core is capable of running six independent parallel program threads on a proven multiple instruction, multiple data processor architecture. And on top of that, we have taken 900 megabytes of ultra-fast SRAM and we split it evenly across the entire IPU. So now each processor core has its own local memory and enjoys an astonishing speed of 47 terabytes per second. <clears throat> and every GC200 is capable of 250 teraflops of AI floating point capability and can support much more IEEE float 32-bit than any other processor in the world. Our IPU has uh, received a lot of endorsements in the market and in his interview with Wired Magazine, uh, Jeff Hinton, one of the leading pioneers of deep learning, has endorsed uh, the GraphCourse IPU as having delivered the next type of compute for the new generation of machine learning models. All these breakthroughs have come together in a single revolutionary product, M2000, featuring four IPUs combined with a very advanced airflow cooling system to fit in an easy-to-handle 1U chassis. Uh, <clears throat> every uh, every four, four of these IPU engines are also combined with a IPU fabric chip to enable M2000s to be connected in a rack or racks of M2000 to be connected together to form very, very large IPU ports. Extremely scalable, where you can scale up from one M2000 providing one petaflop of AI floating point compute to four M2000, which is what we call a IPU port 16, as four M2000 contains 16 IPUs, and then scale out massively to a port 64, 128, 256, and beyond, up to supercomputing scale of exaflops. Introducing the Poplar SDK, which is what we use to program these IPUs to build machine intelligence applications that runs on these IPUs. At the very high level of the Poplar SDK are the standard machine learning frameworks, PyTorch, TensorFlow. What it means is that you can use model codes that you've already written in these frameworks and port it over with very minimal coding to run on the IPUs. Poplar contains a lot of libraries that has all these higher mathematical machine learning functions you require to implement your models. 
and Popular SDK integrates seamlessly with orchestration software like Kubernetes and Slurm, and we use very reliable open source hardware management with OpenBMC and Redfish. We have done a lot of work in the development of Poplar SDK to give full autonomous access to the huge parallelism that our IPU architecture offers. The Poplar SDK manages all the communication between all the different processor calls, manages all the communication between the different parallel program threads, manages the very fast memory access, whether it's the SRAM or the DRAM in the M2000, and all these are supported by standard machine learning frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow. Use cases uh, vary from search and recommendation for consumer internet, price prediction models for finance, drug discovery, and uh, X-ray analysis for healthcare. And there is a whole new market that we call AI first, where as their name suggests, their business is led by a very comprehensive AI strategy, such as automotive and smart city initiatives. A use case here where researchers from the Oxford Man Institute of Quantitative Finance have used our IPUs to dramatically accelerate their training uh, <clears throat> for multi-horizon price prediction models up to a point where they could deliver very huge commercial advantage by more accurately predicting market price movements. And such models can be used in the uh, development of uh, Alpha for fast trading and market making strategies. Another use case here in the insurance industry, this time using computer vision models. Tractable is an AI company based in UK that uses AI for accident and disaster recovery. So they do this by connecting the policyholder, the insurer and the body shop to make sure they collaborate efficiently. Tractable's AI system looks at the damage of the car and decides which body shop that the car should be directed to. And once it's in the body shop, what type of body parts to repair and where should these body parts be ordered from. And they do this by aligning with the insurer. Their pro processing pipeline uses several techniques such as efficient net-based models to feed an attention-based uh, model. And the team at Tractable has evaluated uh, GraphCore against their current training regime and found a five times speed gain which means that what they used to do to take a week now only takes a day. And our IPU has been used in wide areas of research in both academic institutions and industries. Uh, here we see more examples of uh, research papers and um, <clears throat> press articles. For example, the University of Bristol has uh, benefited from a five times speed up in their generative adversarial network applications in their study for CERN's Large Hadron Collider experiment. University of Paris have also um, published a research paper on the use of IPUs to speed up neural network uh, applications for cosmology types of studies. In fact, in, throughout the globally, we have more than 40 universities now uh, that are using IPUs for their research works, including three in Southeast Asia. So HPC is an essential tool fueling the advance of computational science and more increasingly AI is used alongside traditional HPC techniques to run large scale simulations in an accelerated time frame. And the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting has developed a number of deep learning models as part of their publication to study machine learning in numerical weather forecasting. And GraphCore engineers actually took one of the publicly available models from the center, a multi-layer perceptron, and ran it on our IPUs with dramatic results, achieving a five times speed up chip for chip in training throughput against a leading GPU with no optimizations, no use of hyperparameters, and no modifications to the model. And at this point, I'd like to invite Dr. Xavier from Atos to share a little bit about what Atos has been doing with uh, GraphCore. Thank you, Philip. <clears throat> Thank you. Sorry. So, uh, first of all, Athos is, a, is an integrator. So, as an integrator, we're taking the best of breed, the technology we can find, and obviously GraphCore is one of these technology, and we are integrating that in a one single solution. So, we, even if we are French, somehow, we are, as a cooker, we're taking each pieces and we make one recipe 
for a given customer, for a given user. But we are not only integrating uh, different hardware in a, one solution. Maybe you have listened to Agnès Boudot uh, keynote at uh, yesterday or the day before, two days ago, presenting uh, and revealing our latest uh, supercomputer XH3000. So, and in this, uh, in this supercomputer, in fact, we can integrate many different technologies in a single solution. This is very versatile, very dynamic, and we can adapt that to any uh, workload that we have. And among that, we have the graph core, uh, obviously the graph core solution. But Atos is not only providing the hardware, we are going above that and we are providing also services. And here we have a clear example. ECNWF has selected Atos for the production. ECNWF is a research center and it's also a 24 seven operational service. So providing the, the forecast for the members. So here we are facing the two, the two aspects. The first one is making the production, something productive. Every six hours we have to provide the forecast. And on the other side for the research, we are studying what would be the next step. And what has been presented is exactly that. We have studied what would, how we could integrate and speed up, and speed up the workload uh, from ECMWF. So the question is obviously, why we have GraphCore and Atos somehow partnership. And in fact, because AI and HPC, it comes together. Now we know that AI will bring value to the HPC and will replace some numeric, we will replace some numerical kernels by AI and data-driven solution. And at the same time, HPC can produce synthetic data to train model more efficiently and to do some active learning with synthetic data. So both of them benefit from each other. So here we bring the best technology as mentioned, we go up to train people, we have the, the AI and the HPC in the, same, uh, in the same room. And finally, the question will be at the end, how we will reach the exascale integrating this solution? It's not just a matter of taking one, one CPU or two CPU or one node in, in a room, but taking a bunch of hardware and making it work efficiently. And this is where the, the, the legacy, the, the, the track record of Atos is useful because we delivered already top uh, supercomputer and we know how to make them work to the exascale uh, level. So for that, in fact, we took all this knowledge and we integrate what we learned from the HPC to do the same thing for the, for the AI. And here we propose a solution with these three, level, uh, three levels of advice, architect and accomplished. The goal is to be able to deliver trustable, efficient, and uh, industrial, I would say, industrial solution. When you will have to put AI in a productive environment, you will have to be sure that you are produ producing the, the, right, uh, the right solution. You can, uh, all the bugs, all the involvement, in improvement, everything has to be de delivered correctly, and you have to industrial your process. So all these layers has to be ma mastered, and this is what we are, we are able to do at Atos. Uh, if we have one demonstration of the partnership we have together, is this single point is that we have the first system integrator in the world to build the IPU uh, pod 64. So this is a proof of confidence uh, between GraphCore and Atos. And now we are moving up uh, with, when we will integrate these uh, technologies uh, to the pod uh, 128 and uh, 256. So we can scale up thanks to the knowledge and thanks to the technology provided by GraphCore. Another aspect is not about exact scale and it's not about the fact that we, we can scale up. The second aspect, which is really key, is the fact that as an integrator, a customer will only face Atos. So when there is an integration of different technologies in a single solution with GraphCore in this solution, then we will be, we'll face the customer and we know that GraphCore will back up. We, are, we have all the engineers from, uh, from GraphCore behind us to support us in case, in case of really uh, big issues. But we are facing your customer. You have one interlocutor uh, solving your issue and training you and doing all the stuff uh, for you. And I think this is quite an important uh, aspect. And finally, if it works, yes. 
If I go in the solutions that we can provide, we are providing, so we have the hardware, GraphCore, Exascale, and also we have developed our own models, tail-on models with a team called AI for Sim. And the goal of, of this team is to develop specific domain for physics informed neural network, for instance, for CFD, for weather forecast, uh, some kind of kernels. And also we have all the framework, all the orchestration to be sure that the data is moving the right way, that we can operate the neural network in a given environment. And also we are able, thanks to this, no, this boss aspect, to do active learning. So when we train a model, we can see if this model provides the right results uh, for, a given, uh, for a given set or given um, testing set. And if there are some issues and we need more precise results for a given uh, uh, area, I would say, then we can go back, do synthetic data, and do all this loop to improve the learning phase and to improve the, the, the solution. What is sure is that we are relying, for this aspect of training, we are relying on the GraphCore uh, graph solution. Thanks again for providing us with uh, such a nice uh, hardware. Philippe, if you want to take the, the last words. Uh, just want to conclude by saying thank you very much and uh, I invite all machine learning scientists and engineers who are interested in next generation machine learning models to contact either GraphCore or Ethos. We have offices all over Asia Pacific and with that I thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is yours. So uh, thank you, Philip, and thank, thank you, Dr. Xavier. Uh, moving on, uh, our the title of the next talk is NVIDIA Omniverse, HPC Visualization and Simu Simulation Reimagined by Mr. Michael Lang, Solutions Architect Manager, Asia Pacific South, NVIDIA. Let's listen to his talk. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Lang, and I'm the Solutions Architecture Manager for APAC South here at NVIDIA. Today, the session I'm sharing with you is about using NVIDIA Omniverse and some additional tools uh, in, in the space of HPC uh, visualization and some simulation work as well. Now, I'm actually coming at this as a professional visualization uh, expert. So I'm actually coming at this not from the traditional HPC space, but that's actually one of the key points here uh, that's a part of the focus. So I'll uh, see if you can get some value out of that. Today, I want to talk about uh, HPC and scientific visualization as it is today, a bit of a recap of where we're at, some challenges, things of that ilk. Also, what we're trying to achieve in NVIDIA, where the directions have come from, um, what are our innovations in this space, the challenge of 3D workflows, because it's not just one component of this, it's actually multiple components and how they play together. We'll take a bit of a look at Omniverse under the hood, its parts and, and how they fit together, because that's actually one of the key elements on, on this 3D workflow bit. And then, of course, we'll take a look at some examples of uh, Omniverse and some of the uh, visualizations that have been done. And I've got some references to some additional material as well. Like with all good sites, uh, we all stand on the shoulders of others. Uh, and certainly in this case, there's a variety of bits of work from some of my colleagues and people in the industry that are really, really important and valuable to look at and extend very much upon what we talk about here today. But let's start with NVIDIA. So, um, you know, everybody knows NVIDIA and people think they know what we do. But of course, people know us in the space that's most prevalent to their own. So, uh, you know, SCA is talking about a high performance computer infrastructure. So there's all sorts of relevance there to code and, and things of that ilk. But we're going beyond that as well into scale up, scale out architecture, uh, infinity band and networking, now that, you know, NVIDIA and Mellanox are one and the like. But I, I want to really reiterate this piece on the left hand side, which is the professional graphics space we have, and how this is actually really important for what we're talking about here, because you know, in science, many of the discoveries are made in the multi-domain space. And that's actually what we have here. So we've got Omniverse as a tool really to bridge the gap between these two worlds. So I think you'll find this uh, quite fascinating, actually. Now, of course, we have plenty of tools for visualization today. So a couple of them shown here. We've got uh, tools, you know, MATLAB plot and stuff like that that can be used for representing, you know, 3D data sets and uh, anything from Monte Carlo, you know, uh, lattice effects. And, you know, we've got the, the Earth moon up there with um, uh, multiple components and, and topography put together. Um, as you can see down the bottom right there, there's something that's it's really quite a cool 3D representation of, a, of, you know, what would traditionally be seen as 2D data. 
Most of those though are single user, and that's one of the things I'd like to address. Um, but they're very much workstation based tools. That, that's all good. Um, workstation on a laptop or a desktop or even a remote scientific workstation using our virtual GPU technology. But again, single user. Let's scale it up a little bit in terms of the visualization aspect alone. And we've got the cave technology. So a couple of examples there. We've got that here in Australia. I'm coming at you from Melbourne. So uh, Monash uh, or UNSW has got the epicenter there. And these are really quite cool because they're large. They're multi-user. They can be 3D in nature. And uh, they're remarkably powerful. In fact, just referring to Monash for a bit, one of the things that's really powerful here is a metaphor that I learned from um, Dr. Paul Bonington there about how if you consider science as a bit of a microscope, you've got the data gathering, you've got the data analytics, you know, data work, which is you know, a lot of the high performance compute space. The eyepiece at the top is where this visualization comes in. And that's where it allows us as humans to sort of interact here with uh, the data. And that's why it's really quite important. So what do we want to achieve? What are some of the challenges we have? So the size of the data you keep generating is, is a problem. Inherently, it's a problem. Uh, how long does it take to turn that into a visualization piece? Uh, combining both simulation and visualization together, that can be challenging as well. Again, on tool sets, if nothing else. The large scale of data leads to data loading, data transfer, and also data gravity problems. You know, multiple people in multiple locations. We also have given the, the tools we have at our disposal and also the potential latency between the visualization and the research aspect is the iterative nature of science and what that can be a challenge for. Then of course, you know, collaborative workflows. Workflows. If we've got multiple tools, the more tools we have and the more disparate those tools are, the more challenging that can be in terms of having uh, the ability to um, you know, leverage that iterative science. And of course, taking that uh, eyepiece on the microscope example, the lack of visualization leads to a lack of insight. So we want to get past that. Speaking of insight, the quality of the data we can see here is really important. So the quality of the visualization of that data is really important. So visual um, accuracy, our, our acuity here can lead to cues or, or lack thereof. And we've got a couple of examples here in, in, in the top on the right hand side and actually have those two visualizations later on um, in terms of the macro and the micro. So we're not necessarily talking about, you know, being able to zoom in, but the quality of what we can see. We're trying to really stimulate the, the um, scientific creative juices here and, and help with the process of analysis and deduction. So accelerating decision making, narrowing down that, that iterative nature of science. And of course, in the uh, simulation space, we might be talking about the realistic depiction or interaction and effects that take place inside the tools that we have. The better they are, the more we learn. So some of the problems, I've got some speed humps here. We time to value, time to visual, visualization, higher fidelity, ironically with the larger data sets at the same time and larger models, uh, simulation and visualization, ideally both. If we're going for an ideal world here, we'd really be after a multi-user system uh, that's interactive and is scalable, really. But at the same time, and you know, sort of um, paraphrasing Einstein here, we want to keep it as simple as possible, but no simpler because we need a certain level of completeness of our tool set, but we want to reduce the complexity at the same time. So moving that slider can be really, really challenging. And how can we get a tool set that works with this? Ideally, we'd go modular, uh, use what we need, flexible, open, things plug in. We don't have to use everything, but we use what we need. And by the way, not just for our tools, but for other people in this workflow as well. So statement of intent, what we'd like to get. But let's sort of work into this in terms of uh, other people and, and problems they may have. So let's just step out of HPC for a second, and I'd like to take you to some different worlds. So let's start with the architecture, engineering, construction space, manufacturing, design, media entertainment. They all have problems that are remarkably similar to your own. Again, the new normal over the past couple of years has become well, disparate in terms of where people are and where they're located. And as I said, those remote scientific you know, workstations we can get over uh, NVIDIA, VGPU and the like help, but they're not necessarily perfect. And of course, this is compounded by the data gravity problem. Right? Too much data or it is what it is, but in what location, where, what, and how do we get access to it with what tool sets? And of course, um, chasing the single source of truth. And I use truth here in a um, very data-based system, not necessarily in a science space, because 
Well, as you can see here, we've got five separate uh, iterations of the data, or potentially one iteration of data and five different tools creating different outcomes from each of these. That's great, but can, if we've now forked the data in terms of the tools that are using it, can we bring that together again? Or do they stay disparate in what they are? And we've actually have, you have to use multiple separate visualizations to try and get a cohesive understanding of the whole. It's really quite problematic in nature. So it's not just science. So let, let's come back again to, to the problems and what we can try to do to fix it. Well, in listening to our customers, what we've uh, done is created a tool called Omniverse. Now, Omniverse is quite interesting because it has a couple of different elements. So just bear with me here while I uh, sort of talk through these. So with the tool at its core, we have something called NVIDIA Nucleus. And yes, pun intended, Nucleus at the core. Now, what this does is this uses um, a, a storage mechanism, which is not just storage. One of the key things is it uses a common file format. And I'll touch on that one in just a second. And you can actually see here on the left how there's multiple tools it doesn't really matter which ones they are, but they can all access this common store via this common file format. Now, if you only have one tool, you really don't care. If you have multiple tools, you care because it means you don't have to save as. And that saving as in different file formats can lose fidelity and create challenges with versioning. And, and now we have that single source of truth and all this becomes a challenge. So we do care about that uh, single store. But Nucleus is not just a file store. If it was just doing that, that'd be great, but it's more. It actually has a whole bunch of different capabilities in there as well. And you can see some of these mentioned here. We talk about physics using our PhysX engines, materials definition language, path tracing, AI, and all sorts of other bits and pieces. And it is in fact extensible. And on the right hand side, we have, uh, you can see our, um, what we call a portal. So it gives people the ability to peer into this world and see the files that you've created. Again, it's all nice and secure, but it means they don't necessarily have to use the complex tools that you have. Now, let's get back to that uh, universal scene descriptor tool just for a moment, or, or piece. So uh, it's not created by NVIDIA, created by Pixar. Um, so yes, it comes from the media entertainment world, but it's not just that. It's actually a bit of a lingua franca of 3D worlds. And fundamentally, when we're trying to create similar simulations or visualizations, we're trying to create those 3D worlds. So it's open sourced, which means it's fully extensible and it's got all these complex layers and it's multi-user and it's really, really powerful. So it's been adopted by a whole bunch of different tools. Great. It works. It does what we need. Let's move on to some other stuff. Omniverse itself. So expanding out from that diagram I had before, what is it and how the elements work together? Well, we've got a whole bunch of different elements, including some of our favorites. So I'll bring power of you into this, but there's some other ones I'll refer to later. But what it means is whatever tools you use, you use whatever tools other people need as part of their pipelining and workflow. They work with you on the visualization aspects or the, the computer aspects. They have their tools. And even if, you know, never the twain shall meet, they actually do meet at the data layer. And more importantly, they can meet on one cohesive piece of data stored in our nucleus. Now, I did talk about people being at uh, disparate locations. That's great because uh, Omniverse Nucleus has this thing called cache, which allows you uh, data access at a distance as well, which is really cool. Not just storage, I mentioned microservices. So a whole bunch of things in here, rendering, all sorts of stuff that can be taken advantage of. So this is where Nucleus is both a, um, an accessible tool, not just for storage, but also capabilities as well. And of course, that ability for people to peer into Omniverse, peer into your data if they've got the appropriate rights. We've got our Omniverse View, which is a workstation based tool. So I think traditional desktop laptop and Omniverse Create being a similar thing. But View is for View only. Create is having the ability to, to interact. So now people don't necessarily need all these custom high and expensive bespoke tools on the left hand side that are a bit more complex. They may just be able to use the native tool set that we have to actually tweak and tune. And it's extensible in itself using our kit based application. So people can create more to link into that as well. And yes, there are workstation based tools, but you can use virtual reality, augmented reality, and augmented reality, not just on headsets, but also using tools such as uh, laptops and tablets, which is really great. And of course, something as basic as a web browser. So you might have a large monitor or series of monitors, which are used similar to that cave environment to monitor real time the work that you're doing or perhaps just to visualize it. So if we wrap this into a workflow example, this is where we get something that looks like this. 
And again, taken from an industry that's not necessarily the same as yours, but the concept is the same. On the left hand side in the top quadrant, we have people such as yourself who create data or manipulate data or use data. And of course, you know, again, one of our favorite tools, Paraview. This goes into a central store. And again, from multiple tools, it can go to a central store. But then people who are part of the visualization pipelining, bottom left, the visualization specialists. So this is, you know, some of my colleagues who've got some mad skills here or people in your uh, space. They have the ability to use, and we've got a couple of ones here we commonly refer to, Maya, uh, 3D Max, that sort of stuff, but also Unreal as an, as an engine to, to, to see things. So they can tweak your data. And again, people coming in from the right-hand side there just to uh, potentially uh, view the data. So lots of really interesting tools, capabilities, extensible, and we're all trying to be native with what we use in this system. But if we take this a step further, and let's pick on a particular science example, Here's how we have something such as, and one of my colleagues you know, used this um, slide really to good effect, and I love the term human-machine collaboration. It's multi-human, multi-machine, multi-interactive collaboration. So again, you may bring data in via Paraview, but you're going to do different things with it. So we've got the giant render farm off to the left there. That's all good. But we've got the, the artists doing their magic with their tools. But we may have fluid simulations, so CFD, things of that nature other microservices that can plug into it. And there's an example here later on that does precisely that with a, a um, COVID molecule. And then the ability for users to see that either rendered or through VR and things of that nature. Again, all done through the magic of Omniverse at the core here. Taking a different example, I'd like to point to the um, visualization on the right hand side there. And it's, yes, it's got our ray tracing technology and things of that nature. There's a visualization referred to in one of the slides I've got linked later on. Um, the actual uh, cinematic itself is, is super impressive to watch. But here we're talking about the pipelining and, and the creation of this. So, you know, folding at home being uh, used to create uh, various molecules and trajectories, uh, visual uh, molecular dynamics, uh, adding uh, layers on top of that as well, and then into Omniverse from there. From there, there's some other componentry as part of these pipelines. So uh, the spike placement was done with some uh, Python add-ons. A camera path was done using uh, Maya, an AutoCAD tool. And then we've got the Omniverse native tools uh, with materials and lighting and ray tracing and that sort of stuff. Really unbelievably powerful. One of the tools I mentioned a few times here is Omniverse. And, and I've had a couple of questions in the past around, well, how native is it on, on, uh, on Omniverse? And what I want to point out is, if you go to our website here, so docs.omniverse.nvidia.com, um, you can actually get a lot more information about how this works and how it can link in. But I, I want to say standard, standard, standard. It is actually um, Paraview. It's nature. I'll show you that in the next video. But you can do things like you've got the render view, uh, pass arrays, filters, temporal arrays, and, and lots of stuff there. And can link into uh, things like OpenVDB, uh, which comes from Academy Award winning um, houses to do things like um, you know sparse volumetric data uh, in, in 3D grids and all sorts of crazy stuff. So lots of power, but again, totally native in um, Paraview. To show you an example of that, I'd like to show you this video here. So just bear with me while I, I kick this off. And what you can see here on the video is, uh, again, native uh, Paraview and, and the Omniverse connector gets added into that. And here it's connecting to an Omniverse source in a Nucleus, a Nucleus server, and there's some content stored there. But there's also some local pipelining stuff here. Uh, and this is using a um, fuel injection SIM pipeline for uh, stream tubes. So this then gets exported into Omniverse and we can work natively uh, in Omniverse with it. So let me just uh, fast forward that a little bit here to the um, componentry as it gets imported into uh, Omniverse. And this is actually using Omniverse Create because we're tweaking with this a bit, not just viewing it. And here you can actually see, okay, reflections turned on there. So you can actually see uh, the ability to you know, zoom in and see bits and pieces. But uh, what we can also do is we can turn on some of the Omniverse specific capabilities. Right, so uh, here, if we turn on uh, using the menu, uh, real-time path tracing. So, uh, and for those of you who are familiar with uh, the science behind this, you probably see a lot more in terms of you know um, intuitiveness here. But um, the, as the data is represented again, uh, you're getting some really powerful capabilities as the um, the path tracing you know uh, zooms through this every time you you retweet the, the, the view angle you've got here using the camera angle, um, the path tracing kicks in here and you get different bits and pieces. Power of this is required depending on uh, different uh, data sets and the workstations you have. So you can actually uh, tune up and tune down the capabilities here. If this is a virtual environment, again, you could have 
um, you know, one virtual environment that's a bit smaller for uh, just basic stuff or one that's a bit more powerful. So lots of um, really cool stuff here. And um, just going into this a step further in terms of science, so again, some of the work that's been done by others, this one uh, was using uh, not Paraview, but NVIDIA Index. And this one um, is, you know, at the, at the small scale, you know, the micro scale. Um, and uh, looking into uh, this one, uh, a, a mouse brain. Uh, so, um, you know, lattice uh, light sheet mic microscopy uh, to view into um, the real nanoscale here, which is just crazy. At the other end, uh, we have the macro scale. So this one comes out of um, uh, UC Santa Cruz and uh, University of Pittsburgh in the US. Um, and uh, Galactic Winds are using their uh, Trolla simulation library. And the power of this, you know, the, the, the Star Trek geek in me absolutely love this, except this is you know, real data out of the real universe. Um, but again, at the macro scale, the ability to um, you know, visualize and zoom through this is just unparalleled. It's really quite impressive. So again, using NVIDIA Index here as a, as a leverage tool. Going a step further, you can have tools, uh, and this is a, a really remarkable one here. So something that's extremely topical uh, for the moment, uh, sadly, uh, is um, uh, the, um, I'll just zoom through on this a bit further. This is a uh, visualization using um, a COVID molecule. And this one was actually done uh, from the uh, Gordon Bell winners, actually, I think it was. Um, COVID data set, lipid and cell info, and uh, just bluntly a mind-blowing visualization, seeing um, spikes, you know, on uh, as they connect in and that sort of stuff. It's just um, it's used a VMD ingestion with Blender uh, to add into this as well. It's just incredibly powerful. And one of the links I've got later on actually has a voiceover narrating the entirety of what's being done here. But just um, just crazy, crazy powerful. And of course, uh, then we've got uh, potentially what could be seen as the big brass bell. Uh, and this is um, yanked out of one of our YouTube videos. And it's well worth digging into uh, the complexity here. But um, you may have heard our uh, goal for Earth 2 uh, and the ability to uh, visualize um, things that are at a whole of Earth layer. Um, so this is, um, this is looking through that, that power here. I'll just uh, fast forward on a few of these things. Um, but really the power to visualize at uh, large scale um, and again, coming at this very much from a um, somebody who's got a science background but is not an expert in, in earth science in any way, shape or form, the visualizations can actually speak to us here um, in terms of you know, what we can understand through the visualization of data. And this is incredibly powerful. And if I just um, jump into some particular aspects here, you know, obviously with storms and storm clouds, this is where you know, RTX on, RTX off, um, you know, the ability to see, you know, ray trace enhancements and, and really see the fidelity of that data makes a really big difference. You know, storm fronts and what they can do or potentially what they have done. And uh, so if I just sort of come back here to, um, this is pre and post uh, Hurricane Dorian and, and the ability to see these uh, obviously two different data sets and what's happened here. Uh, decision makers for those who may be uh, outside of the science aspect but into the policy making space. Um, really quite remarkable. And uh, here's um, one more uh, advancement on that bit, um, specifically in um, uh, flows from, from stacks, as you can see here, and, and what this means you know, for um, potentially station design and, and things of that ilk. So a lot of remarkable power here on, on what we can do uh, with the tools if we leverage the right data with the right tools and get the right workflows. I encourage you to take a look at these. Expanding on that a step further, um, so here's some of the slides I mentioned that have references to some of the content that's really worth digging into. So uh, one of my colleagues, Nick Leaf, created some of these bits and pieces. He's got some really great talks, both at ISC and, and GDC. So I strongly recommend you take a look at these. Um, also, a couple of my other colleagues who've gone crazy into the, into the depth here. Um, uh, yeah, really, really good stuff to see. Uh, and there's a, a variety of talks here, and there's some certain tracks we have uh, at our conferences. And, and on that note specifically, um, you know, uh, we have, you know, back to that whole cross-domain functionality here, we have some remarkable uh, people and some remarkable collaborations in industry with people such as yourselves uh, that speak at our GDC conference. Um, and again, whether we're talking cross-domain or really highly specific in nature, um, the ability for us to learn from people and what they're doing is just, um, just remarkable. So I cannot recommend strongly enough um, attending GDC. It is a virtual event, 
um, and our uh, CEO Jensen Huang will be on stage, either physically or virtually or both. Um, but again, the, the technology that we unveil, what we show, how we can you know, open the kimono to you there and get your collaboration on this is, is really, really key. So, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a very, um, it's a very key conference where we learn from, from participants in industry as well. So that's coming up at the end of March. Having said that, I'm going to draw this talk to a close. Thank you very much uh, for your attention today, and I hope you've got some value out of this and, more importantly, um, stimulated your creative juices and what you might be able to do with you know, collaboration and our tools such as Omniverse, PowerView connectors and in Index connectors and, and what that might mean for your work and how you can then portray that to others. Thank you very much, and uh, stay safe. Ciao. Thank you, Mr. Michael Lang. Um, for the, I think we can all agree some really great visualizations and this brings us to our last talk for today and for this session uh, it's by mr xavier kui hpc ai senior specialist at microsoft and the title is accelerating life science innovations with azure hpc ai advantages mr kui hi thank you for your attention to microsoft solution for hpc and ai I'm Naoyuki Sogai, who is leading an Asia-wide team for HPC and AI solution at Microsoft, and will be sharing with you today an overview of accelerating life science innovations along with my team member Zavia. With assuming that many of you already have rich experiences of running HPC and AI workloads in on-premise cluster environments, you might have concerns or a few challenges like this with taking advantage of cloud. As HPC AI workloads are very special and diverse per project by project, these points like scalability, agility, extensibility, trustworthiness, and versatile capabilities are all important. Then, while acknowledging these could be challenges with cloud in general. Are these really challenges for Azure, HPC, and AI specifically? Actually, we don't believe so. Last year, in conjunction with COVID-19 situation, National Taiwan University Hospital made a strong progress in its genetic research by leveraging Azure, HPC, and AI capability. The time required for the gene sequencing was improved by more than 40 times than before, which really accelerated the advancement of their research. On top of that, the nature of Azure HPC and AI as public cloud enabled them to utilize the UK Biobank data to incorporate into their research scope more effectively and efficiently. This kind of global scale environment of Agile HPC and AI for accelerating life science innovation like this NTUH case is publicly available for everyone, including yourself. What makes Agile such a market leading HPC and AI solution is its comprehensive design approach combining the best of supercomputing and cloud. We support a smooth path from your baseline for HPC and AI workflow across compute, networking, storage, orchestration, and intelligence services. So you can use the same trusted tools and processes to work with your overall HPC and AI workloads. Azure HPC and AI Cloud is built to fit your workloads, including tightly coupled workloads using the latest CPUs from Intel and AMD, as well as advanced GPUs like NVIDIA A100, all backed by low latency, high bandwidth, InfiniBand interconnect, along with high performing storage like NetApp and Laughter. All those Azure HPC and AI capabilities are optimized to meet your simulation and modeling needs in an agile manner through intuitive user experiences for orchestrations across clusters and jobs in combination with wide variety of market-leading schedulers and tools from third parties. For AI workloads, 
The benefit of Azure HPC and AI can be enjoyed not only by using its GPU directly, but also leveraged through the close partnership between OpenAI and Microsoft, working toward the next generation of very large AI model, as well as innovative Microsoft research projects like DeepSpeed, for notable examples. Also, we have an offering called Agile Machine Learning to provide intuitive experiences for AI ML workloads. Last but not least, these Agile HPC and AI capabilities are well designed to work seamlessly with your on-premise environment by hybrid configurations. So you can utilize it with flexible controls on data and network, just like an extension of what you have been using. With that, I'd like to hand over to my team member, Shavia, to walk you through how effectively and efficiently you can take advantage of such Agile HPC and AI capabilities for your life science innovations workload. Thanks, Marie Kisan. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Xavier Chui from Agile HPC GPP team. Here in this part, I will uh, show you how Azure HPC plus AI can accelerate innovations in life science through several example solution cases across uh, genomic analysis, protein folding, uh, molecular dynamics, and uh, precision medicine such areas. The area of genomic analysis, Azure HPC has two options. In this whole picture of Azure HPC offerings for genomic analysis workload across each layer, such as compute storage networking and path layer, I highlighted the two blocks with a blue color, which named Microsoft Genomic Service and Chrome on Batch Solutions. These two options both need no prerequisite strong knowledge of cloud using and cloud experience. For example, MS Genomic Service can only be used by API calling. It's very friendly for end user. And due to Chrome OS on batch solution is a packaged total solution. And the user can de deploy it directly on Azure only on a click or a one command. In genomic analysis area, let's talk about using the uh, Microsoft Manager Service method at first. Uh, Microsoft offered the genomic managed service uh, for the uh, standard secondary analysis steps in end-to-end -end genomic analysis process. Uh, Microsoft Genomic support BWA and uh, some uh, common GATK functions. Uh, the customer need no experience of how to deploy, how to configure. They just uh, uh, know how to call in the Microsoft Genomic Service API or using the command library interface to, to submit uh, genomic analysis jobs. <clears throat> After the job uh, submitted, uh, the bottom layer things will all be done by the genomic service itself. So we call it as managed service. Customer will not configure the bottom layer computing resource. And uh, uh, it has also has special points of the billing method. Uh, Microsoft genomic service billing by the uh, sample reads, uh, how much reads they are processed and how much it charge. Uh, and it also charge as pay-as-you-go pattern. Mm, customer or end user only pay what they are used uh, on the cloud. So it's uh, quite different for the normal or uh, from the on-premise. And uh, Microsoft Genomic Service can be combined with other Azure portfolio uh, in the territory analysis or uh, 
then the visualization steps is quite uh, convenient for customer uh, for using all on the Azure cloud. We provide the several uh, according components for different uh, scenarios. The second option for the genomic analysis is uh, Chromeware on batch packaged solution. Uh, this also uh, need no knowledge or must have cloud experience ahead. The customer can deploy this packaged total solution only on a click or on a command enter. So uh, the solution package will deploy the, all the resource automatically. Mm -hmm. At first, the quite important is the Chromeware server uh, as the center part, central part in this diagram. And the backend batch, Azure batch will be also configured by the solution package. Uh, this Azure batch will then uh, provision the bottom cloud resources for the building the computing environment pool, uh, which we are leveraging different uh, VM types such as the D series, uh, E series, GPU series VM, and other general VM types. And uh, the Chromeware server will communicate with the Azure batch service. Uh, it do not need customers uh, involved involved the the Chromeware server will communicate uh, by the submit jobs accordingly so all this uh, transaction data or the uh, data log will be stored in the cosmos db and the customer can know the system system status through the application insights service to know uh, what's the usage of the computing results. As for the end user or customer, it's quite simple for them to when submit a job. It, it provided uh, two methods. Uh, one is REST API, uh, and one is to submit the script, job script file and the input sample file directly into the Azure Blob Storage containers. So it's quite uh, simple to just uh, upload it. And then the Chromeware server has a trigger service uh, component to find which uh, new job arrived. And then we will trigger the next Chromeware standard process to analysis the genomic samples. So the uh, when the job's completed, it will the output file result files will be stored in the Azure Blob storage in the right pipe. Uh, it's, it's some it can it different with the input file directory. So uh, it's also very convenient for the customer to submit job and got the uh, running result from the cloud side. Beyond these two options, some customers want to more deeper customization. It's also very easy in an Azure HPC environment. Uh, first, you can select the scheduler type and configure the HPC cluster parameters such as the VM SKU storage OS uh, parameters and uh, some other detailed parameters. And then you can start and provision the according cluster. So a uh, customer can configure HPC cluster through uh, multiple methods and uh, it only need 15 minutes to set up a ready HPC cluster. Uh, also, we have friendly UI to know the cluster status and know the building process. And uh, we also support the customization templates to fasten the building process and the init scripts to customize the actions when building the computer resource. The other advantage of Azure HPC is easy to manage. Uh, it's not only easy monitoring, easy tracing and rebuild. Uh, also, 
very easy for cost control and uh, some AD integration for security prospect. And uh, here I show the Azure Batch UI and the Azure Cycle Cloud UI. You can find that it's very easy to find the exact information for tracing or logging um, in this UI. The next topic is about molecular dynamics on the Azure Cloud. As we know, Gromax, Ember, CP2K is uh, always uh, frequently used molecular dynamics workload. Here is the sample architecture of Gromax on the Azure Cycle Cloud. It's a type of deep customiz customization uh, building process. So here I've appended the GitHub repo link to show step-by-step -step guide. At first, we build the Cycle Cloud server at the first step. Then we configure the HPC cluster parameters through this Cycle Cloud UI page. And we select the Slurm as our scheduler type. And then the computer selects the uh, uh, computer node VM type from Azure HPC rich uh, VM types such as HCRS, NCRS, and uh, other general VM types as a computer node pool. And there are several communications with, between the Cycle Cloud Server and the scheduler after the HPC cluster provision. And when the job submitted in at the scheduler VM, and uh, then the Cycle Cloud know how to provision uh, bottom layer VMs to to meet the uh, resource requirements from the Slurm scheduler. Then, if the after the certain number of computing nodes booted, then the scheduler will dispatch job to the each computer node to complete the uh, molecular dynamic jobs. For the storage part, uh, there, there is a built-in NFS sharing file system between um, the scheduler and the computing nodes. Uh, it, will be, it will be automatically mounted uh, when the cluster provisioned and uh, the input file, output file, and the common library files will also, all can locate it as this uh, sharing storage. And uh, at uh, each time of the computing nodes uh, startup, it will boot from the images of the Gromax application pre-installed image. This image we can customize as uh, as we wished. Uh, you can decide which version of the Gromax and which type, such as the MTI type or uh, single running type of the Gromax. So you can configure the image uh, resource ID into the HPC cluster configuration. And the input output file will be located or put it into the Azure Blob storage for long-term uh, store storage. Here, this slide is show you a standard CP2K benchmarking result from our engineering team. It, it's built across 20,000 calls on Azure. So in this graph, we can see that when the cluster scaled to the uh, exceed 500 host it can the performance uh, the performance is scaled accordingly next let's talking about uh, protein folding on the cloud as we know rosita fold and alpha fold 2 were released at the same day last year they are both the newest uh, revolutionary algorithm 
to fasten the protein folding prediction using the AI algorithm uh, in them. So here is an example architecture of deploy Rosita fold on Azure Cycle Cloud environment. It may be very useful for the university, research institute, pharmaceuticals, and hospital, and other uh, interesting individual researchers to have quick uh, hands-on environment for uh, verify the idea of new protein folding and uh, got the PDB result as quickly as, the, as possible using the cloud infrastructure. So uh, the cycle cloud building process is quite similar with the uh, molecular dynamics process. At the first uh, deployed the cycle cloud server as the first step and the cycle cloud will manage and uh, provision the bottom layer VM resource to build a computing node pool, pool. So the scheduler will dispatch jobs to the computing nodes. That's the same part. The different part with the uh, previous molecular dynamics architecture is here the storage part is some different. We utilize the ANF uh, as sharing file system. You can see that we uh, part partition uh, several part storage parts, uh, such as input uh, width data. Uh, this width data is very important for the AI uh, modeling and usage. And the PDB uh, database file and the, the uh, genomic uh, samples uh, models file. So uh, the computing node also booted from the Rosita fold image. Uh, this Rosita fold image are pre-built uh, previously. Uh, we have a minor modification on the standard Rosita fold GitHub repo. We make it a uh, parallelization uh, to make it uh, make the Rosita fold can be running parallelly. So uh, we installed this parallel version Rosita fold in this image preparation. So we found that in the Rosita fold protein folding running process, less resource required um, for the infra. Uh, so and uh, HPC also have uh, rich GPU options for the cluster building. So we can use V100, we can use the uh, newest A100, and uh, also can use T4 for just uh, some simple uh, protein folding computing. So it also has friendly UI and has, has good operation experience from the end user, which have really cloud experience. Uh, before this solution building. So the right side is the uh, example uh, samples result uh, when after the protein folding computing. So that here is uh, about this topic. Next is the reference architecture for the precision medicine pipeline processing on Asia. Here I show you a uh, Microsoft genomic output files can be stored Azure blob storage. And then uh, we were using the Azure data bricks uh, to have further data analytics uh, with the data lake storage integrated as a storage component. And the customer can merge and analysis data, data from this data lake and uh, through the healthcare API to note the doctor, and uh, in, we can present uh, uh, data insights or analytic results through Power BI. In the data side, Azure also provides the genomic public data sets. Uh, it's very convenient for public users to using these data sets uh, to accelerate analysis process. Uh, currently, our datasets uh, 
exceeds of one petabyte, and more and more always using database or datasets will be included in this public dataset. Oh, that's all. The simple architectures I want to show you how convenient and uh, uh, how to build using the Azure HPC advantages. The next step is to take some hands on and try on the cloud using Microsoft Azure for HPC high performance computing and for the life science verticals. Here is some useful links you may need uh, in the next uh, hands on steps. Thank you all uh, for listening and thanks for your time. Bye. Hi everyone. This brings us to the end of the industry track today um, and also the end of the Supercomputing Asia 22 conference for this track. I hope you find the talks over the course three day, over the last three days very informative. Uh, the speakers have shown that there is a convergence between HPC and AI. They have shown that quantum computing is coming uh, while we don't know when exactly we, 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 it will be available for, for general public, but it is definitely coming. Uh, I would like to thank all the physical, all those that attended the sessions in person and also all of you that attended the sessions in uh, virtually. Uh, and last but not least, there's like a whole bunch of uh, techies behind me that, are, that made sure that everything worked smoothly over the past three days, so I, I have to thank them as well. And with that said, uh, I'm bidding farewell, closing this session, and I hope to see you next year at Supercomputing Asia 2023. Thank you so much.